Thank you, Kevin, for speaking on this topic and giving us a new perspective. Next up, we have Una from the United States of America. She has been crazy about feminism for a long time. She's been doing different projects around this topic. Among others, a project called Girls Rock the Capital, in which she promotes the role and the voice of women in her local government. Today, she'll not only be talking about feminism, but about intersectional feminism. So please give her a warm welcome. inequality between women in it because there's pre-existing social structures of oppression which exist in our society creating inequality along the lines of race, ethnicity, um, ability, and sexuality, and class. And so unfortunately when we're fighting for equality by just dismantling the patriarchy we're not actually getting rid of all these systems of oppression, which means not all women are equal. Take, for example, um, the rallying cry, 75 cents on the dollar is not enough. Well, this only holds true in the US, for one. And even in the US, it only holds true for some women, white women. Um, for Hispanic women, it is 54 cents on the dollar. For black women, it is 64 cents on the dollar. And for indigenous women, it is 59 cents on the do dollar. While globally, only 20 to 30% of the disabled population is even employed. And for women with disabilities, they are two times less likely than men with disabilities to even get a job. Um, so this is where intersectional feminism comes in, which essentially states that a woman's oppression is a result of many facets of her identity, which cannot be separated from each other as they function both to create and um, her oppression, as well as stating that, so in order to liberate women and create equality for all people and between women, we need to fight to end all systems of social oppression. Um, so these are great academic definitions, I love them, but they're a bit distant from reality. So what I'm going to tell you today is a story of our history, and that's the history of eugenics feminism. So one day I was sitting across from this kid in debate class, and he turned to me and said, you know, your life probably would have been a lot better for you if you were never born, you know, because you're disabled. And what he said in this one sentence essentially summed up the main idea of eugenics, which is this 19th century social move movement and, pseudo and debunked pseudoscientific idea that certain people are inherently more worthy um, because of real or perceived biological differences, and as a result, we should socially select for the genes that we consider most desirable. Um, so some of you might start to think, well, doesn't this mean we can get rid of genes that code for deafness? or blindness, or being born paralyzed. Um, one, this kind of stems from an ableist thinking that people with disabilities lead these horrible, awful lives, that we get rid of our disability in a second, that we cannot meaningfully contribute to society. Newsflash, not true. Um, and two, who gets to decide whose life is worthy? And the answer in around the turn of the century when this was a really popular movement was scientists, uh, predominantly white male scientists who, who had able-bodied scientists who perfected the pseudoscience, which said that immigrants of color, black people, and indigenous populations, and the poor were those with unworthy genes, um, and so had to go. And unfortunately, a lot of early feminists adopted this thinking in order to position themselves as citizens, essentially saying, give us reproductive rights and freedom, 
and we will be responsible citizens with them. We will contribute to the moral betterment of this world. Um, and it was feminists like Mary Strokes, the founder of MIS International in the UK, um, that is now an international organization, hence its name, and um, Margaret Sanger, who founded the organization which would become Planned Parenthood. And I want to specify my talk is not to dismantle or destroy any of the work these organizations have done. They are wonderful organizations that have taken steps to distance themselves from these women and their original founding legacy. Um, however, eugenics feminism has played a part in our world and has, even to this day, sh shapes the struggle for reproductive freedom, especially for women of color and disabled women. Um, take, for example, a 2015 court case from Kenya in which five women sued the Kenyan government and MIS International claiming that because they had AIDS, they had been forcibly sterilized um, in government hospitals, which MIS had recommended to them with some knowledge of what happens there. Um, and it isn't just these five women. Um, a Kenyan activist um, wrote a report called Robbed of Choice in which she concluded that this is a systemic issue across public health facilities. And many women went out to protest this, wearing shirts that said, and the forced sterilization of women with AIDS, and my body, my womb, my rights. And you think in 2015, we should, that shouldn't have had to been said. Yet it did, because a multitude of different systems of oppression had acted upon these women to take away from them their choice over their own body and reproductive rights. To start with, um, they had contracted HIV and then become disabled because um, once you, a chronic illness is considered part of the disability community. And so someone had decided or, that these women no longer could have control over their body or make their own responsible choices about their reproductive rights. And so they took them away. <laughs> um, this stems from the idea that people with disabilities cannot be in control of our own bodies. At its very least harmful, it's people who physically move me when I use a cane or people in wheelchairs. It's doctors not listening to people with disabilities. And at its most harmful, it is women getting forcibly sterilized. Um, the second thing is that these women were poor and they had no other choice but to go to these hospitals even if they had an idea of what might happen. And lastly, as someone with a uterus, you have a lot more power over what the future demographics of this world are going to look like, simply because you have the power to create another living being. Um, and so, this can be scary to people who are used to having control over the world and its population. And while they aren't the ones carrying out these unconsensual sterilizations, they are the ones who have every reason not to put stories like these on the front pages of newspapers and to sweep them under the rug. And this is why we need intersectional feminism. Because stories like these are not the ones being told in, across the media. We don't know that 75 cents is, on the dollar is still a dream for many women, and that disabled women struggle to get jobs today. And so, why don't we hear about these stories? Why aren't feminists, why aren't we out in the streets with our pink pussy hats telling people that these things are happening, that forced sterilization is still a thing. It's because these things do not happen to white cis women in wealthy Western countries. And so feminism moves on to different fights and different struggles, leaving many women behind. And when these issues are brought up as part of the present rather than the past, it said, oh no, that's an issue for the disabled community. Oh no, that's an issue for the indigenous community. Well, one, we're, stronger, we're far stronger united than we are divided. And two, no, because these are issues facing women and these struggles are facing them because they are both women and part of these communities and you cannot separate the two. Um, and so we need intersectional feminism so that we can address this. We can look at the multitudes of different ways in which systems of oppression affect women and we can truly end them all to help all women reach equality. And so before I go, I want to leave you with what you can do to help support intersectional feminism. The whole theme of tonight, theme of tonight is starting conversations. 
And that's exactly what I'm asking you all to do. When you talk about feminism, frame it in a way to address the multitude of ways women encounter inequality and equality and talk about it. Frame it in an intersectional lens. Um, additionally, know our past, know the past of feminism and know the past of its leaders, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And finally, when talking with your little siblings, your nieces, your nephews, and your cousins about powerful women from the past, tell them the full truth about these women and make room for a new set of women from the past who are equally as powerful, like Ida B. Wells, Doria Shafik, Rosa Mae Billinghurst, and Audre Lorde. In conclusion, our world is moving forward. We are discovering more about our history every day, and the same should apply to our feminism. We need to know its past so that we can define its future so that it truly fights for equity for all women, and we, frame, and we do this by framing it in an intersectional lens. Thank you, and good night.